All right, so today we're going to do a little bit more on integration. And so I thought I would start off with a really nice integral from a couple of years ago. This was, I think, from one of the Virginia Tech problems. So we want to look at the integral from 0 to 3, the integral from 0 to 2, 1 over 1 plus the maximum of 3x, 2y. I think we're squaring it. We are squaring it dx dy. OK. So as written, the problem is correct, but I don't like writing the problem like this. Whenever I have multiple variables in play, I like to be very pedantic. So what do you think I would love to do for this problem to make it a little bit more readable? I'm sorry? No, just notationally. You don't need to do this, but I just like to do it. It makes me happy. I like to just state which variable belongs to which integration. Doesn't take much to make me happy. And again, sometimes people might just write dx dy by mistake, and they might actually mean dy dx. I think it's always a good idea when you have multiple integrals going on to clearly say which is the integration variable. This will sometimes help you in terms of making mistakes and realizing, oh, wait a minute, maybe the bounds of integration depend on one, and I've got to be careful how I do things. So is x the inside, or is x the outside? It's the inside, because we're doing dx. So x goes from 0, y goes from 0 to 3. OK. If you look at this, this problem looks asymmetric. By now, you should realize that asymmetries are bad, and are just meant to mask things and hide things. So the first thing you want to do is ask, is there a symmetric version of this integral? Because again, I mean, I can start drawing what's going on. It's going to be a rectangle. You know, a rectangle is not a horrible shape. You know, it's much better than you know, a congressional district. It is a shape that you can recognize. You, know, you can show it to Kayla and Cameron, and they can go, rectangle. All right? Look at some of the congressional districts. Uh, I don't think they're all continuous. Yeah. So, you have something like this. What could we do to make this look nicer? How could we change variables? Yes. Good. So we've got x here. We've got y here. x is going from 0 to 2. y is going from 0 to 3. And so this is the point 2 comma 3. And so, um, do you want to see which way I did it? So I chose to let u equal, I think I wanted to do 3x. And I chose v to be 2y. And now if I look at this, x goes from 0 to 2, u is going to go from 0 to 6. And similarly, I'm sorry? What am I? I'm sorry? OK. So if u equals 3x, is it the other way around? When x equals 0, u equals 0. When x equals 2, u equals 6. When y equals 0, v equals 0. When y equals 3, v equals 6. I've just noticed that I think looking on my notes, I think I actually made a mistake in terms of my bounds of integration. And I think I wrote u goes from 0 to 1, v goes from 0 to 1. It should be 0 to 6, but not a big deal. I'll fix that later. What's nice about this is now I have a square. And again, I've got a square from 0 to 6 rather than 0 to 1. The question is, where do I want to do this? Well, by doing it this way, I'm making this part look nice, and I'm changing my bounds of integration a bit to be from 0 to 6. I could have things go from 0 to 1, but then I'd have a factor of 1 sixth here. You know, it's just a question of where do you want the bloop to be. You can have it either in the integrand or in the bounds of integration. So if we now do this, dx dy, well, dx is 1 third du, dy is 1 half dv. So dx dy is going to be 1 sixth du dv. And so we get our integral is the integral of 1 sixth y is now v goes from 0 to 6, integral 
u goes from 0 to 6 of 1 over 1 plus the maximum of u v squared du dv. All right, that's not so bad. In problems like this, one of the first things I was saying is you should look at it and see, is there something missing you know, that we could add and make things nice? So is there anything missing that we could add? Maybe like a, a 2 max u v on the, on the bottom? Don't really want to add things on the bottom, because if you change the bottom, you've got a Taylor expand, geometric series expand, that's very bad. We could add the max on the function squared on the top and then subtract the max of the function squared on the top. And if we do that, you know, we have 1 plus max squared over 1 plus max squared, which is 1. And then we're left with integrating the max squared over 1 plus max squared. It's not clear, is that better than doing it like this? You know, in the other ones, we had sine cubed plus cosine cubed in the denominator and a sine cubed up top. Well, yes, then we want to add a cosine cubed. It makes things really nice. The integral of cosine cubed is the same as the integral of sine cubed. Do you think the integral of max squared over this is the same as the integral of 1 over this? No. So, that kind of addition, it might be worth doing, but it's not going to convert it to two copies of the same integral. All right. For problems like this, it's not a bad idea to just draw it a little bit and see what's going on. So now in UV space, you know, we go up to 6. Now we've got 1 plus the maximum of UV squared. Where does U dominate over V? the lower right triangle. So in this region, the max is u squared. And similarly up here, the max is v squared. So maybe one way, yes? Would you then want to split, split the integral into two? So we could actually, we could split into two and say this integral is either twice this integral or twice that integral, because by symmetry they're the same. And now we get rid of the max function. And so now it's a question of which one is better. And so you know, when you do enough of these problems, it becomes clear. If you haven't, we have two possibilities. So we have 1 sixth, and then we'll have 1 half. Now if we're doing it this way, we first fix a value of v, and then u is going to go from v to 1. right? So v goes from 0 to 6. Then we have the integral of u goes from v to 6 of 1 over 1 plus u squared du dv. Right? All right, anybody remember the derivative of the function whose derivative is 1 over 1 plus u squared? Octan. Octan. Right, one of my favorite functions. This is related to the Cauchy density. It's a wonderful distribution. It has infinite variance. And so there's a huge discussion as to what is the right way to model the stock market. And there's a bunch of people who think that the right way to model the stock market is flipping coins. This is the random walk down Wall Street. This is the Brownian motion. Then there's other people who believe in a fractal behavior on Wall Street, that the random walk model does not give you enough days of large deviations. And if you look at a Gaussian, the Gaussian has rapid decay in the tails. And hopefully we'll get to the Gaussian later today. Something like the Cauchy distribution has infinite variance. And the Cauchy distribution gives you more days of large fluctuations. And a lot of people say it does a much better job of fitting. And so there's a lot of great work into something like this. What's interesting is you can actually fit the Cauchy and the Gaussian into one family. We have a perimeter that varies and allows you to interpolate between them. And so I'll put some comments about this in the additional reading. This means we would have to integrate this as the octangent, get octangent of 6 minus the octangent of u, and then we would have to integrate the octangent. Let's put that to the side for the moment. The other option is to try to do it the other way. And we do it the other way, it's 1 sixth, 1 half. And now if we go in this region, the maximum is v squared. 
Oh, uh, oh, sorry. Yes. Why is it one half and not two? Oh, it's probably two. Sorry, sorry, it's two. So, sorry, thank you. Okay, so I could switch to the other region, and then in the other region, um, I'm going to fix v, and then u is going to run from zero to v. It looks like that might be a little bit nicer. So I'll have the integral v goes from zero to six. Integral u goes from 0 to v of 1 over 1 plus v squared du dv. This looks much nicer. Now, of course, I could change variables here and change the order of integration and essentially make that into an integral like this. This is the fundamental idea in Calc 3. If a double integral is hard, try switching orders. I will post a video from when Cameron was about two years old where he teaches people how to switch orders of integration. Okay? It's not that hard. Okay? Is the U integration difficult here? What do you get when you do the U integration? We get? What, 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 what do I get? I need a number or a letter. When I integrate U from 0 to V, what do I get? Yeah, I just get v that I multiply by 1 plus v squared. So this is equal to 1 third integral v goes from 0 to 6 of now v over 1 plus v squared dv. And if I had really prepared this lecture ahead of time, I would never have multiplied the 2 and the 1 sixth together. All right? That's a horrible, horrible decision. Don't do algebra needlessly. Wait until the very end. Why is that a bad idea? Yeah. And then notice, oh, the numerator is the derivative of the denominator. So this integral is very nice. It's going to just be 1 sixth the natural log of 1 plus v squared evaluated at v equals 0 and 6. When I put in 0, I get 0. When I put in 6, I get 36, 37. So I get the log of 37 over 6. Does this look reasonable? So can someone give me one good feature that this number has? Uh, it can be a really weak complement, but give me one good feature the solution has. It's positive. Right? I'm integrating a positive function over a positive region, and I get a positive number. Uh, years ago, when I was a graduate student at a school that will remain nameless, in a Calc 3 class, they had to integrate the function e to the minus z either over the surface of the unit sphere or over the entire unit sphere. And one of the students was upset about the lack of partial credit they got for this argument. And they said, you know, the integral of the exponential is the exponential of the integral. z is an odd function, so the integral of z is 0. Therefore, we have e to the 0, which is 0. And I gave them 2 out of 10 points for noticing that there was symmetry in the problem. And they were upset that they did not get more partial credit because they filled up two pages. I thought, you know, a point a page was fair, but they, they noticed that it was symmetric. And that was a good thing to notice. But why should they have known that this can't be the right answer? I'm integrating a positive number over a positive volume. I can't get zero. I've got to get something positive. So sometimes really weak tests like this are enough to detect certain mistakes. So over here, we've got a positive number. All right, can you give me an upper bound for this integral? What's the largest this integral could have been if we go all the way back to the beginning? What's the largest the integral could have been? The, in the largest the integral could be is 1. The area is 6. So whatever we get should be at most 6. And if you look at the log of 37 over 6, 
Well, the log of 37 is approximately the log of 6 squared. So that's going to be 2 log 6. Uh, that's about the log of 6 over 3. Hmm. You know, it's definitely less than my upper bound. Then in terms of trying to figure out maybe roughly how big this is, well, we're squaring these things. And you know, most of the time, x and y are actually going to have a sizable amount. What's the smallest this could be? Well, the smallest is when x equals 2, we have 6, 36, we have 1 over 37, right? So a lower bound would be 6 divided by 37, which is about 1 6. So hey, that's about what we have over here, right? So this is actually a pretty good answer. You know, it's larger than the lower bound, it's smaller than the upper bound, it seems reasonable. We have a logarithm, we've got 1 over squared things over there, it's not so unreasonable that a log comes into play. And again, you want to get into this habit of whenever you have a problem, can you check it? Can you somehow see if there's anything reasonable in it? Okay, any questions about this? Okay, so the next suggestion of a topic to do was differentiating identities. And this is one of my favorite topics in mathematics. When I teach probability, we do a lot of this in probability. It's a great way to calculate quantities you care about. So of all the stuff we're doing, this one is extremely important. It also has a very fun story in the beginning uh, related to the great uh, Richard Feynman, uh, which continues our connections to Princeton. So when he was an undergraduate, graduate student, he would often have people come up to him stumped on math problems and asking him to help. And he would frequently get these integrals to do that people couldn't do, and he would solve them immediately. And people were just absolutely amazed at how great he was. And what he says in you know, these stories is he had a different technique that most people didn't know about. He knew about differentiating under the integral sign. And he argued as follows. The people who are asking me questions are not dumb. You know, I'm not TAing into a calculus. You know, these are smart people who are stuck on difficult problems. They have almost surely tried all the standard tricks. And I'm sure they know how to use these standard tricks properly. If there was an integration by parts, if there was a trigonometric substitution, they would have found it. Because they haven't found it, it's probably not going to work with one of those. But because the problem is assigned or useful, there's probably a way to do it. Let me try differentiating under the integral sign. And he would go straight to that. He wouldn't bother the other stuff because he would assume they've already tried the easy stuff. Now, sometimes it is a bad assumption in life to assume people have tried the easy stuff before they bring it to you. But he would just you know, go straight to the more difficult methods, and it would work. So what I want to do is I want to talk about differentiating under the integral sign or differentiating identities. So differentiating under the integral sign or identities. So we actually did one early in the semester. We did the sum n goes from 0 to infinity of x to the n is 1 minus x inverse, at least if the absolute value of x is less than 1. And then we applied the operator x d by dx. And the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivative. This is where you take an advanced analysis class to justify that. And then you would get the sum n goes from 0 to infinity of n x to the n. The n comes down, we have n x to the n minus 1. The x bumps us back up. And then this is going to be when the dust settles x, 1 minus x to the negative 2. So we did this earlier. We then took x equals 1 half, and we got this beautiful formula, the sum n goes from 0 to infinity of n divided by 2 to the n is uh, 2. Wonderful result. If we applied this again, we could get um, the sum of n squared over 2 to the n. Things would get a little bit more complicated on this side. In terms of proving this, if you want to see a rigorous proof of this, let me know. Uh, we proved this in advanced analysis. One of the ways to do this is to note the following just very quickly. What is the difficulty in saying the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivative? Why should you be a little bit concerned? The sum is infinite. The sum is infinite, right? Whenever you see an infinite in mathematics, you should be worried. Okay? If not, go to physics, go to economics. You know, they will accept you. But in mathematics, whenever you see, they will. You know, if you're well trained in math, they will take you. Whenever you see an infinite in mathematics, you have to be very careful. And you have to justify 
you know, switching the orders of operation. Most of the time, you cannot switch the orders of operation. Think about compound interest. Which would you rather do? Have the interest calculated and then add money to your bank account, or add money to your bank account and then have the interest calculated? Order matters. Square root of a sum is typically not the sum of the square roots. You've got to be very careful about switching orders of operations. Sometimes it can be done. In calculus, you should prove that the derivative of f plus g is f prime plus g prime. Have we talked about proving that a finite sum, you can switch the orders? All right, so I'm going to just quickly do this because it allows me to review which proof technique. Induction. Yeah, and we haven't done induction in nearly uh, in too long. So now imagine we have three functions, f plus g plus h. And we want to show the derivative of the sum is the sum of the derivatives. What we do is we just group two of them together. So we have f plus g plus h. And then this is going to be the derivative of f plus g plus h prime. So this is f prime plus g prime plus h prime. And now we can remove the parentheses because of associativity. And we now get f prime plus g prime plus h prime. So arguing like this by induction, we can prove whenever you have a finite sum, the derivative of a finite sum is the sum of the derivatives. The infinite sum, however, you've got to be very careful. It is not always the case that a infinite sum, the derivative of the infinite sum is the sum of the derivatives. You do have to be careful. The geometric series is particularly nice to work with for the following reason. If I look at the sum n goes from 0 to infinity of x to the n, I can write this as a sum n goes from 0 to n minus 1 of x to the n plus a sum n goes from n to infinity of x to the n. The sum of the first piece here, well, that's only finitely many terms. That's no problem. n goes from 0 to n minus 1 of x to the n. For these terms, I have an infinite geometric series. I can pull out the x to the big n at the beginning, and then I'll have a 1 over 1 minus x. I have a finite sum. So if you want to understand what's going on, you can now differentiate term by term here. And this is the tail. And then you let big N go to infinity. So if you wanted to make this rigorous, this is the easiest case to make things rigorous. In general, you have to develop some techniques from analysis. Okay? But in the special case of the geometric series, we are fortunate in that if you truncate it, you actually have a geometric series again, just with a multiplicative factor. This is the bring it over method. And so if you really um, wanted to play some games, uh, do people want to play a game right now and see if it works? I have no idea if this will work. Yeah? What if we called f of x our initial sum? So take f of x to be the sum n goes from 0 to infinity of x to the n. We've just shown f of x is the sum n goes from 0 to n minus 1 of x to the n plus x to the big n times f of x. So now if we subtract, we get 1 minus x to the n of f of x is the sum n goes from 0 to n minus 1 of x to the n. So f of x is the sum n goes from 0 to n minus 1 of x to the n over 1 minus x to the n. See if you can actually get things to work out using the quotient rule and then some algebra. We've now got a finite sum up top. You might be able to get things to work out. So just you know, play with stuff like this. The geometric series is particularly nice because you have these closed form expressions and you get it back. That is rare. But it's worth keeping that in mind. That is something that's exploitable. All right, so let's see what else we can do with differentiating identities. So we've got this form, the sum of n over 2 to the n. How many of you have ever been in a situation where somebody wants you to calculate the sum of n over 2 to the n? All right, no one has been there. All right. So since no one's been there, then let's do something else. What is the sum that you've been asked to calculate? 
It's got to have some kind of n dependence. Give me examples of sums that depend on n that you might have had to calculate. 1 over n squared. 1 over n squared. That's hard because the n's in the denominator. Binomial, we can do that. But something easier than the binomial, rather than 1 over n squared, just n squared. You know, what's 1 plus 2 plus n? Or more generally, raise everything to the kth power. What does that sum equal? How do we prove this? Induction. Induction. All right, we've done case k equals 1. We've done case k equals 2. You need to know those formulas by heart. If you're doing any problem-solving competition, you've got to know sum of integers, sum of squares of integers. Obviously, these are not going to be sums going off to infinity. If they were going off to infinity, it would just be plus infinity. You want to know how the answer depends on n. It turns out this is always going to be a polynomial in n of degree k plus 1. The leading term is n plus, I'm sorry, is n to the k plus 1 over k plus 1, and the constant term is 0. You can see this by using the integral test. You know, this sum is approximately the integral of x to the k. We integrate x to the k, we get x to the k plus 1 over k plus 1. If we take, if we add 0 to the k, we don't change anything. If we take n equals 0, the answer should be 0. So whatever polynomial we get, it's got to be 0 at 0. And so if you want to try to figure this out, let's say I was feeling particularly mean when I was writing the exam, and I decided I wanted you to evaluate this when k equals 2014. And I'm not really feeling that generous. I'm tired of watching teams other than the Red Sox play in baseball this late in October. I will not give you the induction step. I will not tell you what the sum equals. Are you up the creek, or do you have a way to figure out what that polynomial is? So I'm not going to tell you what the polynomial is. When you do things by induction, you kind of want to know that inductive claim. I'm not giving it to you. Could you figure it out if your life depended on it? How could you figure it out? Let's do k equals 2. So we know it should be something of the form, you know, a n cubed plus b n squared plus c n plus d. Let's pretend we're not clever enough to notice that a is one third and d is zero. The way we could figure this out is we could take n equals zero and see what we get. We could take n equals one and see what we get. N equals two and see what we get. N equals three and see what we get. And when you look at what goes on. You have your matrix A, B, C, D. When you take n equals 0, you get 0, 0, 0, 1. When you take n equals 1, you get 1, 1, 1, 1. When you take n equals 2, you get 8, 4, 2, 1. And then when you take 3, you get 27, 9, 3, 1. And then you just get the values over here. Then you just take the inverse of that matrix, and there's your coefficients a, b, c, d, and now you can do the induction. So if you do not have the formula for induction, you can actually sniff it out. This is mildly unpleasant when k equals 2. If you notice that a is 1 third and d equals 0, it's not so bad. Now it's a 2 by 2 matrix. If I give you k equals 2014, it's a nightmare. I'm going to show you how you can prove the formula for the sum of kth powers without knowing the answer. So I always kind of feel when you prove these things by induction, it feels a little bit like cheating because someone is giving you the answer. This is the method of divine inspiration. If you're divinely inspired, that's great, but what happens if the inspiration isn't there? How do you do it? Well, what's nice is this gives you one way to approach the problem, but the problem is what if you have something that's so complicated that it's not going to really be that tractable to get? That's going to be a real pain. The method I show you, I've been able to get it to work up to k equals 2. Beyond k equals 2, the method becomes so cumbersome it's just not really worth it. But it's a nice way to highlight what we're doing. And so for that reason, I will you know, spend a few minutes you know, showing how to do things. So study you know, 0 plus 1 
plus n. So let's try to figure out what this sum equals. And so we're going to start with the geometric series. What is the sum um, k goes from 0 to n of k? Well, that's the goal. We know the sum k goes from 0 to n of x to the k. This is a finite geometric series. The finite geometric series is going to be 1 minus x to the n plus 1 over 1 minus x. What should we do? How can I get a sum of k? What should I do to this? Derive it. Derive it. So do I want to take the derivative with respect to x, or do I want to do x times the derivative with respect to x? So if I do x, it's going to keep things nicer. You know, I'm going to keep things to the kth power. It's not going to make a huge difference. It will make things a little bit more complicated on the right. The real advantage is if I then wanted to figure out the sum of k squared, if I do x d by dx, then it'll be set up much better for k squared. So I apply x d by dx, and we will now get the sum k goes from 0 to n of k x to the k equals x. And now, what rule do we use to take the derivative of this? So what will we use to take the derivative of, of this part over here? Come on, guys, calc one. The, one the, right. the, the quotient, oh, sorry. Uh, this one. We use the <coughs> quotient rule. So you always have to be careful. It's f prime g minus f g prime. So the derivative of this is going to be negative n plus 1 x to the n times 1 minus x. And then please watch me for algebra mistakes, minus the derivative of this, which is negative 1, times this, which is 1 minus x to the n plus 1 over 1 minus x squared. Is that correct? All right, so let's look at this. So we get the sum, k goes from 0 to n, of k x to the k is equal to x. All right, so now looking at what's going on here, we have negative n plus 1 x to the n minus, and a minus becomes a plus, n plus 1 x to the n plus 1. Minus and a minus is a plus, so plus 1, and then minus x to the n plus 1. Did I make an algebra mistake? I think I made an algebra mistake. No. That looks right. Have I made any algebra mistakes? What happened to that back there? One minus x? Yeah. Over here? Yeah. I just multiplied through. A, so I have n plus 1 x to the n. And then a minus and a minus is a plus n plus 1 x to the n plus 1. I'm sorry? This. Well, it's because I'm taking the derivative of 1 minus x to the n plus 1. Yeah, but in the next line. In the next line here? Yeah, in the next line. Right here? Is, is the algebra correct here? I think the algebra is correct. Uh, enough of us say the algebra is correct that in the interest of time, I'm going to assume it's correct, and let's go on. I think this is just multiplying everything out, and it works. You can begin to see that the method may not be the easiest to use, it will work for this, it will work for the next one, it will work for any finite one. What value of x do I want to take now to get the sum that I want? 1. So when I take x equals 1, I get the sum, k goes from 0 to n of 1, I'm sorry, of k, is equal to 1 times this. What do I get in the numerator when I take x equals 1? It might be easier to look up one line. What do we get when we take x equals 1? What's the numerator? Mm, yeah. 0. What's 0 over 0? It's actually n times n plus 1 over 2. <laughs> How would we handle 0 over 0? L'Hopital. We're going to L'Hopital this. 
Okay? I actually went through and did it all the way for k squared. I actually have done the calculation in full detail. It's not pleasant. I don't know a good way to automate it. But what I like about this is there is no divine inspiration that is needed. I do not need to think at all. I can just mindlessly crank things out. So I want to do L'Hopital. So I've got to take the derivative of the numerator. So I get negative n, n plus 1. This is L'Hopital. So negative n, n plus 1, x to the n minus 1, plus the next term is n plus 1 times n plus 1, so it's n plus 1 squared, x to the n, the plus 1 that goes away, minus n plus 1, x to the n. And what does the denominator become? 2, 1 minus x. What do you think is going to be true about the new? Negative. Uh, negative 2. It's not going to matter because I'll make the exact same mistake in the next line and it'll cancel. What do you think the numerator is going to equal? When you put in x equals 1, what's the numerator going to equal? What will it be? Nope. What does the numerator have to be when, when x equals 1? What's the denominator? Zero. What does the numerator have to be? Zero. Has to be zero. If the numerator is not zero, I've got the sum is infinite. I'm sorry, but there's no way that if I sum zero plus one plus two plus dot 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 plus n, I get infinity. It has to be zero. Let's look. n times n plus one times one, n plus one squared. Okay, everybody has an n plus one. And I'm left with a negative n plus an n plus one minus a one. Hey, it's zero. So we have 0 over 0 again. What do we do? L'Hopital it again. All right. So I, I hope you're enjoying this. You know, this is an application of L'Hopital. It prevents thinking. Okay? If we do L'Hopital one more time, we get negative n, n plus 1, n minus 1, x to the n minus 2, plus n plus 1 squared times n x to the n minus 1 minus n plus 1 n x to the n minus 1 divided by, the, now we're going to get another negative sign, so we're going to get a 2. Hey, we've got the 2 which we're looking for in the denominator. That's looking good. What about the numerator? Well, at x equals 1, the x to the n minus 2 doesn't matter anymore, right? I can factor out an n plus 1 from every term. Oh, and every term also has an n. So I can factor out an n, n plus 1 over 2, and we're left with n minus 1 plus n plus 1 minus 1. Oh, so close. Oh, wait, wait, we've got a negative sign here, right? So if we put in that negative sign here and actually do things correctly, the n's cancel, the negative 1 and the plus 1 cancel, we're left with a 1, and as the dust settles, we get n, n plus 1 over 2. In some sense, this should probably be the worst proof you've ever seen of the sum of the first n integers. Okay. As an exercise, do the sum of the squares. Okay. If you want, I've got the calculations, you can see it. Try to find a way to make this work nicely for all values. You know, can you calculate the sum of the cubes, fourth powers, fifth powers? Yes. You do enough work and enough L'Hopital, you can do it. But I can't do an arbitrary one. I don't know how to make that algebra work out. But this shows you the power. And once you have things like the geometric series formula, either the infinite or the finite version, there's a lot you can do from it. And I really want to drive home this point, because part of the purpose of this class is to emphasize techniques. This idea of differentiating identities, there is a lot you get from that. The idea is it's very hard to prove identities in mathematics. And once you have an identity, you want to get as many more from them as you can. OK. Any questions about this? All right. This is not anything you would put on a competition, because then you would have to grade people's algebra. 
and you would not want to have you know, people running down algebra and trying to follow this. All right, so what I want to do is talk about now differentiating under the integral sign. And so the idea is we want to have an integral that depends on a parameter. And we want to be able to differentiate with respect to that parameter and generate more things. So in probability, we often have x is a random variable. We have a density f of x, which is greater than or equal to 0, and the integral from minus infinity to infinity of f of x dx equals 1. And then we define the moments. And there's lots of notations. I'll use this notation. Bold e for expected value of x to the k is the integral from minus infinity to infinity of x to the k f of x dx. So the mean, or the average value, is just the expected value of x. We often call that mu for mean. It's so important. The variance is the expected value of x minus the mean squared. It's a measure of how spread out you are. We call that sigma squared. And it turns out that this is the same as the expected value of x squared minus the square of the expected value of x. So we were talking earlier today about the difficulties of interchanging orders of operation. Is the expected value of x squared the same as the expected value of x squared? If that were the case, there would be no variance, and everything would always be the same. This would be the subject of thermostatics. Nothing changes. Most things in life change. So typically, these will not be equal, and it matters which order you do things. It turns out that if your probability distribution is nice, if you know its moments, you know the distribution. You should think of the moments as playing a role analogous to the coefficients in a Taylor series expansion. If you know a Taylor series expansion, you basically know the function. If I know the moments, I basically know the probability distribution. How many of you have ever been in a class where the professor gives you the mean on an exam? Only like a few people? Just some class where the professor tells you the average grade in this exam was the following. How many of you have ever been in a class like that? I'll remedy it if you haven't. How many of you have ever been in a class where the professor has told you the standard deviation of the class, how spread out things are? My sophomore year in college, I was at Yale. I was visiting a friend of mine at Harvard. And the professor not only gave them the mean and the variance, the professor also gave them the third and the fourth moments, the skewness and the kurtosis. So you could really measure yourself against your classmates. It fostered a wonderful atmosphere. So you can know, ex for the most part, the mean and the variance, they're the most important moments. But occasionally, the other ones come into play. So let's consider f of x equals 1 over lambda e to the negative x over lambda if x is greater than or equal to 0 and 0 otherwise. And we'll say x is a random variable with the distribution exponential with parameter lambda if, it's, if the density of x is this density. Unfortunately, there are some people in the world who define the exponential density the wrong way. These people write lambda e to the negative x lambda. These people are evil. It's bad notation. But it does exist. You have to be careful. I much prefer this notation because I'm dividing my variable, my quantity x, by lambda. If you look at the average value of this, the average value here is lambda. The average value here is 1 over lambda. I want my parameter to represent the average value of my quantity. I much prefer this expression. So the first thing is to note that this is a probability distribution. So if we integrate from minus infinity to infinity of f of x dx, this is the same as integrating from 0 to infinity of 1 over lambda e to the negative x over lambda dx. Is this a hard integral to do? Hard integral or easy integral? Easy. I mean, if you want, you can let u equal negative x over lambda. du is going to be, I'm sorry, just x over lambda. du is going to be dx over lambda. This becomes the same as integrating uh, u goes from 0 to infinity of e to the minus u du. And then this becomes negative e to the minus u 
at 0 and infinity, if I've done everything correctly, becomes just 1. This is not a bad integral to do. OK. It turns out it's very useful to calculate the moments of this distribution. Well, if I want to calculate the moments, I've now got to integrate things like x times that, or x squared, or x cubed. So if I wanted to calculate the mean, I would want to calculate the integral from 0 to infinity of x times 1 over lambda e to the negative x over lambda dx. Before today, how would you calculate this? How would you calculate this? Integration by parts. Integration by parts. Right, so you would integrate by parts. We're going to do this without integrating by parts. So 1 is equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of 1 over lambda e to the negative x over lambda dx. So we're going to start with this expression. We could differentiate this right as it is and just differentiate both sides with respect to lambda. I find it a little bit more convenient to just move the lambda over. All right. I'm going to differentiate both sides. What should I differentiate both sides with respect to? What variable? Lambda. lambda. Can I differentiate both sides with respect to x? What have I done to x on the right-hand side? What's happened to x? Does x exist anymore on the right-hand side? No, no, x has been integrated out. There's no more x. I can't differentiate with respect to x. x is gone. Lambda is the parameter I can differentiate. When I differentiate with respect to lambda, I'm going to have an e to the minus x over lambda, and I'm going to pull down the derivative of this. I'm going to get a negative x, the lambda, so I'll get an x over lambda squared, right? So it turns out it's going to be useful to apply lambda d by d lambda. All right, when I take lambda d by d lambda of lambda, what do I get? Lambda. That's not so bad. Now on this side, I'm going to just push the derivative through the integration sign. Am I always allowed to do that? No. In any math competition, gamble and just do it. All right? And then worry about justifying it later. You say the left-hand side is lambda. Oh, sorry. It's lambda. Thank you. And now I take the derivative of this. So I get e to the negative x over lambda. And now the derivative of x over lambda is x over lambda squared. But I multiply by lambda dx. Look at how nice life is. Lambda times 1 over lambda squared is 1 over lambda. I can rewrite this as lambda is the integral from 0 to infinity of x times 1 over lambda e to the negative x over lambda dx, which is the integral from 0 to infinity of x, my density f of x dx. I have exactly the lambda I want. What is the mean of the exponential? Mean is lambda. And that's why this is the right way to define the exponential. Because the exponential with parameter lambda has mean lambda. If you did it the other way, you would have the exponential with parameter lambda has mean 1 over lambda. And it just, just bothers me. If we want to calculate the second moment, if we want to calculate x squared, what would I do? So how would I get x squared? Good. Half a minute. Take the derivative again with respect to lambda. Now, the only thing that's a little bit complicated is now I've got a lambda over here as well. And so to make things simple, multiply through by lambda and have lambda squared. Now take the derivative again and take lambda d by d lambda. And now you'll get 2 lambda times lambda. So you get 2 lambda squared is the integral from 0 to infinity of now we'll get an x e to the negative x over lambda. We have a lambda outside. We have an x over lambda squared dx. We have the x's combined become x squared. We have the lambdas combined and become a 1 over lambda. And so when the dust settles, we get x squared 1 over lambda. 
there's the second moment. And now once we have the second moment, we can get the variance. So you just play this game, you keep one of the lambdas over here, you keep moving, moving back. We'll do the Gaussian on Wednesday to just you know, finish up this unit. But this is an extremely powerful technique. It's an extremely useful one for solving problems we care about. Okay.